zero analysis for episode 18 and we get started off with puck father daddy showing up calling us a bunch of degenerates and raining ice onto betrigus's men it is crazy how a strong puck really is and even like the unseen hand it doesn't damage anything and Biko said this is like pucks returning to his normal form now i'm not sure if this large form is a normal form maybe it is but clearly there's a difference in how puck is stored when emilia's contract is still in place versus the puck that is now that happens after emilia has died betrigus funny as hell as usual his eyes were literally rotating like his eyes were rotating around doing some sort of like finger orchestra when i just look at him it's a mix of like scary and cute you know what i mean better use is honestly cute and there's some really interesting dialogue here used by puck he says then grow a thousand shadows a mere half of what satala could do the shadows here i'm a little bit confused on but because he says that after Better Goose attacks Puck with these unseen hands, and obviously there's multiple hands here, what do we see? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You know, the eighth one is holding on to Subaru. Some of them are probably, you know, attacking Puck. But apparently, we need a minimum of 1,000 hands. That's what I'm assuming the shadows is. And Satala can use 2,000 unseen hands because she is obviously way more powerful. And now, does that mean... But that's like an authority of sloth, right? I'm not sure if these shadows is specifically mentioning about the authority of sloth, but I just can't wait for the moment that Subaru uses his witch's miasma and can use powers like this. There is no way that we're simply not going to use powers like this, right? I refuse to believe it. This dude continuously gets strong with each regression. The miasma stench gets thicker and thicker. He can even see the unseen hand, which is a nice utility bonus. But beyond that... I would love to see some power fantasy moments where Subaru, you know, uses, let's say, the Unseen Hand or even different authorities that we don't even fucking know about because clearly there must be an authority of, like, Envy, Lust, Greed, yada, yada, yada with the other seven sins. Puck, pretty strong. I think that uh, someone mentioned something about the fingers here. He always, like, bites his fingers out of frustration when he's being slothful. I thought that this is his way of like repenting for his sins or he's just a fucking madman and he is and he's just bleeding out but he really really always bites his fingers when he gets like pissed off or like something bad happens true madman and it's kind of fucked up how even if we kill better use he's like happy about it because this is like a cult members like way out it's almost like a suicide bomber you know at the end of the day my cause has already been met. It's for this greater good for the witch. So you know what? This sacrifice, it means that now I'm going to go to the witch now. Basically like Valhalla shit. Like a warrior's death, but a cultist's death. So even if you kill him, you can't really get much out of it. It's just kind of annoying. And then he says, we broke, in, uh, we broke a promise to Leah. There's this mentioning of like how important a promise is to a spirit's art user. And my interpretation of that was because Amelia, or spirit art user, clearly makes a contract with the spirit. That is a promise, which is important to keep. Therefore, if you break a promise to a being that, you know, has these contracts as part of her entire kit, then that's why it's bad to break promises. I'm not sure if it's like a spiritual art contract thing or if it's specific to Amelia. But because Puck said, again, to a spirit arts user, I'm going to assume it is the contract. And third, what did he say? You let Leah die. Did we let Leah die here? <sighs> it's an unreasonable thing to say that, but yeah, she did die. Thanks to our actions of wanting to tell her the secret. Did we know it was going to happen? No. Did we want it to happen? No. But it still did happen, so Puck's placing the responsibility on us. It'd be nice if Puck could actually fucking do something other than just show up when Amelia fucking dies. Like... I understand for the story to be more balanced, you need to take out really strong people out of the story. Because we can't always be bailed out by Roswell. We can't always be bailed out by Reinhardt, right? They're gone. One is on Curtis leave. Roswell's apparently meeting some important officials. Puck has this 9 to 5 fucking contract, and it's just like up to us to figure it out, right? And this is interesting too. In accordance with my contract, I will now destroy the world. Implying that... When Amelia made the contract with Puck, Puck said, Hey, Amelia, if you die, I'm going to destroy this world. And Amelia was like, okay. 
right? Why would you agree to this? Why is he so mad? There's no other reasons to live other than for Amelia. That's it. Puck is just the biggest fucking simp for Amelia. If she dies, there's no reason. What is Puck and Amelia's relationship? I have no clue. They jokingly say it's like a father and daughter relationship. But beyond that, we know nothing about Amelia because she was just found in a forest with Puck by Roswell. We saw Roswell and Puck fight in Memory Snow. But until I know more backstory of their characters, I have no clue what, like, why Amelia matters so much to Puck, why he's gonna fucking just destroy the world. I don't know. I got no clue, but uh, very interesting reasoning in the contract here. What else happens? Amelia is my entire reason for existing. Again, we don't know exactly why that is. There is no reason for me to exist in the world without her. Why? <laughs> and at that point, I think I mentioned a reaction that you should do some corny, cheesy main character shit and say, then I will give you a reason, Puck. Live for me. And that was based on the logic of Subaru being good with spirits. But right now, Puck being this mad. <laughs> I mean, I still try. I would still try it. Why not try it, right? The fog is coming closer. Now, this is even more interesting. Because the white whale is referred to as gluttony in the past. And even something like Puck saying it's a troub troublesome being, Puck is showing like respect to the white whale. So you can already, f like, the power scaling for the white whale is unreal, right? One of the important lores that we learned is that the subjugation force with the previous Sword Saint died by the white whale. And Sword Saint, Reinhardt, right? Who knows the previous, you know, Sword Saint? Maybe the title is the same, but maybe they're not as strong as Reinhardt. But still, it's just like really hyping up really hyping up the power scaling of the white whale. Gluttony. Gluttony is a sin, obviously. But, oh, I suppose they call it the white whale now. So, a long time ago, it used to be called gluttony, but now it's called the white whale. Why? I don't know. Maybe the lore changes as time passes on. When we mention gluttony, I immediately think of the witch of gluttony, or the archbishop of gluttony. We know that the white whale is a witch fiend, and I think that I said, maybe this could be the Archbishop itself. Wait, 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 wait. It's a witch fiend. Meaning, maybe the Archbishop or the witch created the White Whale, this witch fiend. Maybe that makes sense. But there is this relationship with gluttony in the White Whale, which is very interesting. Or maybe each sin has their own monster. That would be cool. That's like a gluttonous White Whale as it consumes everything. And then there's like a prideful beast, like a fucking lion. <laughs> I don't know, my head cannon is going crazy now, but that would be kind of cool, huh? To have like a beast, a mythical beast that is so powerful and scary, like a catastrophe class, disaster class fucking monster associated with each sin. That would be really cool, but this white whale, gluttony. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you called it here. That's so unreasonable. Again, it's like... We didn't mean to, but of course the witch fiends are attracted to the miasma released by Subaru. But like, you called it, you, come on, Puck. <laughs> and now you die yourself. Well, bitch, you fucking froze me. And then the laugh here is very interesting. I'm like, who is laughing? I'm like, what? Is this Betrigus laughing at us? No, it was Subaru laughing at himself because he hates himself. And I'm like, whoa, ho, ho, ho. it's me. I'm laughing at myself. I let Remdai kill them. And this is the moment of acceptance. We're going through like the seven stages of grief and he's pretty much just come to terms that he is useless. The way that he perceives himself to be. We know he's not useless, but so far he has seemed to be useless and he's perceiving himself to be useless. And he actually accepts, you know, the, the faults before he would lash out and project these problems. But now he's actually accepting. He laughs. And then he says, you truly are slothful, Subaru. Bye. Puck, which is kind of fucked up that Puck literally understood Betrigus's like classic lines of Anata Taira Desne. And then Puck just like says that shit on our deathbed. It's kind of funny, but kind of fucked up at the same time. And then we wake up, and that's pretty much it. And I have a lot to talk about regarding the Rem and Subaru shit. And of course, because I'm recording this video after I've reacted. Like, right now, it's 5.35 p.m. the next day. I reacted to this episode last night. And the reaction itself is going to come out later. And I'm going to wait for the comments. I think there's going to be so much content that we can farm off of simps 
that are Rem glazing and say Subaru doesn't deserve this. Subaru is an L. And then the other people saying, nah, Rem trash, goat Subaru. There's going to be so much discourse to farm off of. So I'm going to let that video uh, cook and not really go through this video. But basically, you know, the voice acting here is comes down to this. Subaru actually realizing how weak and pathetic he is. He's finally been beaten down so much and he says it's hard to give up. Every one of those runs that he's encountered, right? It's hard to give up. But Rem says no. It's easy to give up. And in fact, I know you. I know the heroic side of you. The way that you perceive yourself is so sad. The way you perceive yourself is so pathetic. But the way that, but the way that I perceive you, the hero that saved me in Arc 2, that's the super I remember. And because you have someone like Rem being there as the ultimate support, emotional support, just there, just there for you no matter what, it is kind of unreasonable, right? I think that there definitely is a sense of power fantasy here, right? Because like, of course, it would be, it, it's wonderful to have someone like this stand by your side, but think about it. It's like this perfect girl that will be with you no matter what, even if you fuck up, even if you mess up, she'll be there for you no matter what, cheering you on, and... If you even reject that girl and you pursue a different girl, she'll still pursue you. I think a lot of people get pissed off at this concept, right? Because think about it. It is unreasonable. If we just look at what's happening and think about how much Rem has folded for Subaru and to give him this unconditional love, even though he does not love Rem in the same way he loves Amelia, it does seem kind of bullshit, right? It, it seems very bullshit. But you also have to realize that Subaru has earned this affection from Rem due to the acts of Arc 2. A lot of people talk about the torturing of Subaru in Episode 7 and how it's accurate for Subaru to reject Rem. But they don't even, But these people are not here to have a genuine conversation. When people go out and make stupid arguments about how could you expect Subaru to love Rem when he tortured Rem, take a step back and realize that Rem did this because the witch's cult murdered her family. The stench of the witch is heavy on Subaru. He's being very suspicious. And he decided to per she does the pursue him on that. Of course, it's extreme. But I can understand where she's coming from based on the actions he's portrayed in Arc 2. But after we get that shit settled, Rem went out of her way to sacrifice herself to kill all the witch fiends so that Subaru's curse wouldn't activate. At the risk of her own life, she went there to save Subaru. I think a lot of people coming into this conversation shitting on Rem for torturing don't even remember all the good shit that Rem did, right? Not only did she sacrifice herself to help Subaru there, and then what happens? She then supports him all the way in Arc 3 right now. The Twister episode, episode 15, crawling, right? Saving Subaru. Like, a lot of people are cherry-picking moments just to have a dishonest argument and completely forget about the good shit that could have a reason for Subaru to love Rem despite the torturous acts of Act 7. Sorry, Act 3. Sorry, Arc 2. But that's pretty much it. I have a lot to talk about. What I just said is pretty much just like the very high level talking points that I have in mind. And I know for a fact motherfuckers are going to be mad whether or not they be Rem Glazers or whether or not it be, you know, fucking uh, Subaru Glazers. There's going to be so much content. And I'm going to come at each comment with logic and Facts. And you know what? And you know what? Fuck Amelia. No. I don't know. Amelia. I don't really know anything about her, to be honest, because she's been out of the story for so long. And Subaru's like love for Amelia. Again, love is such a indescribable feeling that you either do or you don't. But sometimes people like, do you think Subaru like fell in love with Amelia at first sight? I think the term love at first sight is bullshit. How could you possibly love somebody if you don't even know them? You see their physical appearance. That's lust. That's not love. That's just you being horny because they look hot. I don't believe in love at first sight. But that first run, for sure, Amelia, quote unquote, saved Subaru, right? Amelia portrays these actions of selfless sacrifices that Subaru seems to really resonate with and say, a girl like this is going to go rest of wasting her life forever. And the more I think about it, the more I realize that Subaru is talking about himself, right? The whole act of the selfless sacrifice, right? I think it's what Subaru is, is doing, right? It's like him wasting his time trying to act selfless. But here's a different thing. I think Amelia is truly selfless. 
But Subaru acts selfless up until now. Anyways, there's going to be a lot. There's going to be a lot of farming to do with the REM shit. So I can't wait. This analysis is obviously going to be short. I think, I think this part's definitely more interesting in terms of the lore. After that, it's just a shitload of voice acting. God tier voice acting. It's crazy that this entire episode was majority just voice acting. Little too new animation, but the episode fucking popped up. Because that's how good the stories and the characters are. That's just a fucking writing diff. And I'll see you guys on the next one.